thanks everybody for, for tuning in. And today we have Anatoly Dimarsky, who's going to talk about generalized Gibbs ensemble of 2D CFTs. So Anatoly, thank you very much, and whenever you're ready. Sorry. Uh, there is an echo on, on your side, and I was asking, uh, would it be possible maybe to uh, mute your microphone for now, unless someone has a question? Oh, yeah, I fixed the comfort too. No, it should be gone now, then. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yes, it's, it's, excuse me for this. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to speak about our recent work. Uh, it's a little bit outdated. Okay, we're going really fast. Sorry, Anatoly, we, we, can, we can hear you for some reason. You, you cannot hear me? Oh, right now we can hear you. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, I will just uh, calculate the generalized partition function. Uh, here, everyone has uh, And uh, in the end of the talk, I will be speaking about uh, generalized uh, eigenstate thermalization in the context of two dimensional theories. Uh, this is uh, a conjecture that, uh, that, that, is, that is our current understanding how thermalization in two dimensional theories work. So uh, let me start with a quick <coughs> motivational slide. I want to explain why I'm interested in uh, this problem of uh, thermalization in two dimensional theories. Uh, there, there are basically two very good reasons to uh, be interested in this question. Uh, one uh, important re reason is that uh, two-dimensional CFTs have proven to be uh, a very strong, very potent uh, calculational tool when it comes to studying uh, non-equilibrium dynamics. Uh, that all goes back, maybe not all of it, but uh, a lot of it goes back to works by Cardi and Calabrese, uh, who were able to use CFTs to uh, analytically predict dynamics in the two-dimensional theories, uh, following a quantum quench. Uh, excuse me, there is some, some noise. Okay, so it's done, it's done now. Okay, so, so uh, Cardi and Calabrese about 10 years ago uh, have made significant progress using CFTs to study analytically dynamics of, of 2D theories following a quantum range. Uh, they understood how entanglement spreads, they understood how two dimensional theories thermalize, and uh, they were able to apply two dimensional CFTs. They describe one plus one dimensional systems, they describe one dimensional uh, spin chains essentially. So uh, they were able to use those CFT methods to describe quench dynamics of uh, even non, -integra non integrable uh, spin chains, uh, slightly with slightly broken integrability. And, and uh, that can be checked against numerics that, that is very closely related to cold atom experiments. And of course, that's a very significant contribution. So that is one strong uh, motivation. Another motivation is a bit more theoretical. In that case, CFT is not playing the role of the computational tool, but it plays the role of the non perturbative definition of quantum gravity mediates three. If you want to understand um, black hole physics and uh, how black hole is formed and presumably how it evaporates and how information paradox is involved, uh, we can ask all of those questions, at least in principle, uh, on, the, uh, um, on the side of the boundary CFT. And those questions would have the form of studying thermalization. Okay, 
uh, and uh, this is of course very well known. I'm just I'm just trying to repeat what motivated me to, to work on this. And once we understand that we want to study thermalization in two-dimensional theories, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, um, an important theoretical question is to understand uh, what uh, what structures out there. Maybe CTs are very special, or maybe they are not special at all. Maybe they behave like all other systems. And uh, a, a very concrete theoretical question I have been interested in is to understand if the framework of eigenstate works uh, for the CTs. This is the question I think we are more or less understood. I have a conjecture that uh, eigenstate normalization works. It does work for two-dimensional CFTs, but it, but it has to be extended to what is called general SDPH and other words from uh, the uh, The particular situation of 2D theories is that uh, any two-dimensional CFT is actually an integrable system which has an infinite number of conserved charges, local conserved charges, which commute with each other, and Hamiltonian is one of those charges. And since this is the case, the, the, the dynamics, the organization dynamics, any other time evolution, any other dynamics in two-dimensional CT uh, is subject to infinite number of constraints, so it's infinite number of conserved quantities. And we have to take that into account. That, of course, affects thermalization. That, of course, affects how eigenstate thermalization works. That is likely to affect black hole physics also. We do not really understand how exactly. So basically, my talk today is an attempt to understand first steps to understand how presence of integrability structure affects thermalization in two dimensions. Okay, after this uh, um, motivation, uh, let me uh, go forward and start discussing calculating generalized position. First, I want to remind you what is uh, integrability structure of the series. The idea is very simple. Uh, you start, um, I, I do not know if you uh, can see my uh, error on the screen. Hopefully, that's what you do, and if I highlight something, uh, maybe you do. So I will try to do that. Sorry, Anatoly, we. We have some problems with the with the audio. We cannot hear you properly. Oh, I was asking, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's yeah. better. That's better. Oh, you, I was asking, yeah. You hear an echo if, if we leave our microphone on, right? Yes, um, I, I hear an echo. Yes. Can, can you see? Can you see that I highlight something on the screen? On the on the screen? Yes. Yes. Can, yeah. Okay. Good. So <clears throat> I will use that, but instead instead of the pointer. Uh, so let's start with the Hamiltonian of two-dimensional CFT. That is simply, uh, I quantize my CFT on a cylinder. That's not a uh, complex plane quantization. That's what is called radial quantization. So my uh, space is a circle of the circumference L, and the coordinate in the circle is U. If I integrate stress energy tensor, I get the Hamiltonian. That's what is called Q1. But then there is an infinite number of charges. First non-trivial charge is called Q3. They are all odd. They are uh, all indexed by odd numbers. And the second one is Q3, and that's just an integral of T squared. As you can guess, Q5 is an integral of T cubed, but that's not so simple because Q5 has as it's an integral of T cubed, but there is a, there is an additional uh, additional uh, term on top of T cubed. There is something else which you need to integrate over the circle. So the simple form of those two charges, it's only for first two ones. And when you try to write down, <coughs> excuse me, when you try to write down uh, the form of those operators in terms of the versor generators, then the uh, Hamiltonian is simply L0 minus C over 24. That's the conventional formula. But then Q3 already has quite, quite, uh, quite bulky form. And then Q5 is, is much larger, and you, know, you already need two full lines to write it down. And Q7 is actually currently not explicitly known. So those uh, operators are rather complicated, and uh, it's not clear how to deal with them. Their spectrum is not known. 
uh, something is known, people could have, people have written thermodynamic different angles, uh, so the, the equations are known, but uh, the solution is not known. So the, the spectrum, uh, at this moment, the extent of my knowledge, of the region which and talking to the experts, uh, there is no any reasonable way to study the spectrum. So what we have understood recently about the spectrum, I think, is the uh, first concrete step in that step. Okay, so these are the charges. They do commute with each other, but uh, that's all we can say. <coughs> now, the one about the position function, we need to understand the charges better. The goal is to decorate the exponents by adding evenly to one way to five. Okay, so that's the math to calculate. We're trying to write the sum of the exponents two. And we try to calculate the space over all states, which means that we are summing the whole primaries and all the descent. Uh, Anatoly? Yes. Uh, one question. Could you go back one slide? Uh, yes. So, for the case of the Vita Soro generators, we have um, a geometrical interpretation of how they act on operators, right? There's yes. simply generate conformal transformations in two dimensions. Yes. So for the case of the KDV charges, is there any geometrical interpretation? If you act, I mean, if you calculate, the, say, the Poisson bracket of some of the charges with some field, does it give you a, a nice geometrical interpretation or not? Uh, well, I do not know if what I say will count as a geometrical interpretation. They are called uh, KDV charges for a reason. They are called quantum KDV charges. If you forget about it. Take uh, Q, any Q you want, for example, you take P3, and you calculate. Uh, Great. And Anatoly, we can't, we're having trouble understanding your microphone again. Can you, you were holding it a different way earlier, perhaps, that made it easier. Okay. Like yeah. this? Yeah, just, whatever you're doing now, keep doing that. <laughs> okay, uh, let me see. Could Hello? You... Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Can, you, can you hear? Uh, let's see. It's a bit strange because I never had problems with the microphone before. Let me see if I can maybe I doubt that, but okay. tune it a little bit better. Is it better? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's better, yeah. Thanks. How about this? <clears throat> Is it better? Yes. No. Oh. What, no? It's worse than before. It's, uh, it's, it's worse than before, it's better than before. This is okay right now. Was fine. What, what right now is fine. Okay, okay. I switched to the built-in microphone, so maybe that will be better. Good. Yeah, yeah it's much better. Yeah. Okay. So, so could, uh, you, could you repeat the answer, please? Yes, yes, of course, yes. So if you take Q3 and you start and you calculate a commutator of Q3 with the stress, uh, stress energy itself with T field, uh, the result, at least in large C limit, if you take C to be very large and you neglect all one over C corrections, the result will look exactly like uh, a KDV, a Kordivac defreeze equation. And uh, higher charges act on T exactly higher, higher Kordivac defreeze charges act on, on the classical. Uh, in, in the context of Kardovec's defreeze, there is the function u of x, and the Kardovec defreeze equation is the, what q3 generates, and then q5 generates uh, what is called higher Kardovec defreeze equation. And all of them generate, if you, in the limit of infinite C, they just generate all of the, the star of higher Kardovec defreeze equations. Uh, those, this action is not linear. Uh, Kardovec defreeze equation by itself is not linear. So uh, there is no uh, nice geometric interpretation in terms of uh, vector fields. I'm sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in terms of the vector fields. Uh, but uh, I suppose it gives you some intuition. I, I do not know if that fully answers your question, but that's what, that's what those charges do. OK, yeah, thanks. OK. Uh, okay, so, so if I want to calculate a partition function where I take all of those charges, they all commute with each other and with the Hamiltonian, I add them to the Hamiltonian. Mu1 is uh, what we would normally call beta, and I take them to the exponent and I want to calculate the partition function. Uh, that's what I, we are going to do now, but uh, anticipating what 
the result. I just want to say that uh, it's much better to write the answer, not in terms of the original variables mu, but in terms of the variables t, where essentially mu is a combination of mu and mu1, which is beta. That is not so important. Well, this is important, but this is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that t also includes some power of c. The fact that it includes pi squared and 6 is absolutely not important, but the fact that it includes c is important. So if I introduce variables t and I try to calculate the partition function as a function of those t uh, variables, and, and beta, of course, and central charge, then the free energy, which I define like this, with perhaps wrong sign, unconventional sign, it just f is just a logarithm of the partition function, then uh, free energy, it will have this form. It will have a central charge explicitly in front, of course, the size of the system, beta, and then all of these functions f, f0, f1, f2, they're only functions of t. They don't depend on beta, they don't depend on system size. Of course, this is in the limit of large system size. I'm only calculating the extensive part. <coughs> The fact that F0, F1 do not depend on system size is just common sense. The free energy has to be extensive. But importantly, F0 does not depend neither on beta nor on central charge. The explicit dependence on central charge goes here in the denominator. So we have a nice one over central charge expansion. So essentially, coordinates T help you organize correct, well-defined one over central charge expansion. And then functions F0, uh, they're a function of t, and we can calculate it explicitly. That's actually a very simple thing to do. And then what uh, we accomplished recently in December, we were able to calculate function f1 completely. So here I'll only give you a first term in the perturbative expansion, but there, we have a full non-perturbative answer. And uh, as you can see, there is c in front of this whole thing. So f0 is multiplied by c. F1 gives you order one contribution. And then these terms, excuse me, F2 term, which we cannot calculate at this moment, although it's likely we will be able to calculate it soon. But in any case, this F2 term is actually genuinely one over C suppressed. So if C goes to infinity, you, it doesn't even contribute to the partition function. So essentially, in the limit when L goes to infinity, thermodynamic limit, which we are discussing, we have those two terms, which means that we essentially know the partition function. Okay, uh, so as a warm up, let's try to calculate uh, the partition function, just the thermal one, when I only have the conventional Hamiltonian in the exponent. So please look at this formula. I have the conventional Hamiltonian in the exponent, and uh, the Hamiltonian is just up to constant is just L0, the spectrum of L0 is uh, badly degenerate. I uh, can have a primary state and I can have many descendants of the same level and as usually called level. <clears throat> and there, there is a lot of degeneracy. If n is a big number, then I have as many different ways to uh, have this energy, as many ways I have to, re repre to represent integer n through a sum of other integers. So when I try to calculate this partition function, I need to sum over all primaries, something which is model dependent in principle, theory dependent. Then I need to sum over all descendants. And then the degeneracy is given by this uh, Ramanujan function, which is calculating uh, the number of integer partitions. And in the exponent, I have uh, delta plus n, just the energy. So uh, the next step is the following. If I work in the thermodynamic limit when L uh, the L is very, very large, it goes to infinity, then uh, I can say that delta and N will be very large. And for large N, uh, Ramanujan formula has a nice asymptotic, it's just exponent of square root of N, that's this term. And then I also need to know the <coughs> density of primary states. And density of primary states can be reconstructed from the Carter formula. We know that uh, when energy is very large, Cardi formula applies, and Cardi formula is this one, excuse me, is this one. So by reverse engineering, uh, you can see that the primary, the, the density of primary states, uh, it, it looks exactly like Cardi formula, excuse me, it looks exactly like the Cardi formula, but the only difference is that instead of central charge, 
you need to have central charge minus one. And indeed, if you start with this formula and do the integration and say that your energy is simply the uh, sum of delta plus n, you end up with a Cardi formula, which essentially, by definition, by the way how Cardi formula was derived, gives you the right answer. And you get the right answer for the partition function in the thermodynamic limit. So this is the, uh, this is the correct answer uh, for free energy. Okay, so what do we learn from this? We learn from this that uh, at saddle point, the uh, effective value of the primary is related to the effective value uh, of the descendant level, and the difference between them is C minus one. So the, these formulas are exactly the same, but there is a difference C minus one. Uh, so what is important here is essentially that delta is roughly C times larger than N. So if you say, of course, L goes to infinity, this L goes to infinity, so N goes to infinity and delta goes to infinity, but N is roughly C times smaller than delta. And that is important because that's, that's the scale in which we need to take into account if we want to calculate partition function decorated by higher charges. So that's the most important lesson to learn from this simple calculation. Excuse me, one question. The N appearing here, in the last equation, you mean the n at the saddle point? Yes, this delta and this n, these are saddle point values. So these okay. are effective values where the integral is getting most of its contribution. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now I want to calculate the partition function which is decorated by those Q charges and they look horrible. So the first thing to understand is what is the leading contribution? And uh, it's actually not difficult to do because the leading contribution is just given by the maximal power of L0, which is highlighted in red on the slider, so I will not highlight it anymore. And uh, we will see in a second that this is indeed the correct scaling, but of course this constant, for example, is absolutely unimportant because in the thermodynamic limit it gives no contribution. Q1 is divided, is multiplied by B divided by L, so this constant doesn't contribute. L0 squared here gives most important contribution, and this guy gives zero contribution in the thermodynamic limit because, again, it doesn't scale correctly with the system size, and so on and so forth. So if we only look into this red operators, then essentially the eigenvalue of L0, we can simply call it E, and we immediately get this formula at the bottom of the slide, uh, we have the Cardi formula, uh, the square root of energy, that's the Cardi formula. Then we have beta E and mu3 Q3, but instead of Q3, we now have E squared from here and so on and so forth. So now if we calculate this integral using certain point approximation, <coughs> we, get, we get the leading term, which I call F0. And <clears throat> to calculate F0, all we need to do is to solve algebraic equation, which solves these, which finds the subtle point. So that is done on the next slide. On the next slide, I do that, but I do it in a slightly rescale coordinates. I say that my energy is proportional to this variable sigma. Variable sigma will be only dependent on variables t, which I introduced a couple of slides ago. And the saddle point equation is this one. It's just, if you go back and plug all of these new variables, and in terms of sigma, subtle point equation is this one, and then the, well, and the function F0 at the subtle point is given by this one. So F0 is some very complicated polynomial of T. It has T uh, dependence explicitly. It also has T dependence implicitly in terms of sigma, in inside sigma. But it's still not a big deal because it's all algebraic, so in principle, if you want, you can write a computer program which will just generate all of these expansions. And even better, the explicit expression for uh, sigma in terms of t is given in our paper. It's an infinite series. And the explicit expression for F0 in terms of t was first given by uh, Alex Maloney and collaborators. And you can also find in his paper or you can find it in our paper. So in principle, the explicit uh, infinite series uh, for F0 and sigma in terms of t is known if, if necessary. Okay, so we have calculated F0, that wasn't difficult to do at all. Uh, and uh, just let me say that on the gravity side, that is dual to the classical gravity, that is dual to the conventional uh, BTZ black hole, so that's not particularly interesting. Uh, 
Uh, one thing though, which I need to emphasize is that since we are working in the subtle point approximation, uh, let me go back to the previous slide, then essentially Q3 is just equal to E squared, Q1 is just E, Q5 is E cube, which means that expectation value of Q5 is literally equal to the expectation value of Q1 squared, excuse me, to Q1 cube. And expectation value of Q3 is just literally, literally equal to Q1 squared, okay? So that is reflected here. If I introduce charge densities, I calculate expectation value of those Qs in the generalized ensemble, and I divide by the system size to get the charge density, then all charge densities are powers of energy density, okay? That's just the result, that's just a consequence of subtle point approximation. And now this limit, this is an exact result, which means that F0 satisfies an infinite series of constraints. So this equation can be written in terms of F0 and its derivatives, because expectation value of Q is, of course, a derivative of free energy with respect to corresponding chemical potential. So indeed, F0, the function F0, which is defined here, it satisfies an infinite series of those equations. OK. Any questions? No? Okay, so now I want to go beyond that and I want to calculate one over C correction to the partition function. And that's the most important thing because that is dual to quantum corrections on the gravity side and that already distinguishes between, uh, that already um, reduces, excuse me, this is already removes degeneracy of the spectrum. If I'm only dealing with L0, then L0 degenerates all descendants at the same level. But if I add one over C corrections, that will remove the degeneracy. So in terms of Q3, I already took into account this term. This term is a constant. It doesn't contribute in the thermodynamic limit. This term doesn't contribute in, into the thermodynamic limit either. Only quadratic terms in L will contribute. So I need to take into account this guy. This guy is more complicated. But there is an insight. If you, I write down a matrix of this operator in the conventional basis, uh, then I will see that there is a term which scales linearly with the central charge. There is a term which scales linearly with the delta. And remember, when I will be calculating things in the subtle point approximation, I would want to take delta to be of order C. So these two terms are sort of scaling linearly with C. And then I have a term which is completely independent of C and delta. And apparently, and of course, it is one over C suppressed. And apparently, if you calculate those matrices, you will see that both of those matrices are, <coughs> excuse me, lower, triang lower triangular. And since they are lower triangular, it's not so easy to diagonalize them, but it's very easy to understand their spectrum. Because the eigenvectors of those matrices are non-trivial, but the spectrum is just the values on the diagonal. And that allows us to immediately calculate the spectrum of those matrices in terms of the conventional basis. So I have a conventional basis of CFT when I take a primary and I add by um, Verasoro operators indexed by E numbers, M1, M2, and so on and so forth. That gives me a particular basis. Those vectors are, excuse me? Okay. Uh, those vectors are eigenvectors of L0. They are not eigenvectors of Q. They are combinations. They are combinations as an eigenvector of Q. But that's still okay because the matrix is lower triangular. Therefore, to calculate the eigenvalue, I simply calculate the diagonal matrix element. And I can calculate very easily those diagonal matrix elements. And uh, what I get is that QC, Q3C has this spectrum, this uh, value of the spectrum, and Q delta has this contribution to the spectrum. I need to add both of them, so I multiply this by C and multiply this by delta, and I add those two things together, and that gives me the spectrum at the first non-trivial one over C order. Okay, so this is explained in more detail on the next slide. So I say that now, I have a new basis, which is truly an eigenbasis of Q3, but miraculously, I can still parameterize it by the same set of numbers MI. Because of this triangular, lower triangular form, I can choose uh, 
a particular MI and say that uh, a particular uh, set of MIs and can say that each uh, eigenvector is parameterized by MI. And uh, you see this eigenvector MI, it starts from this vector, but it also has a lot of other vectors of the same form. But roughly speaking, the sets here, they are smaller in a particular sense of dominant order. That's a lower triangular structure. So here I have a lot of other states which look like this with different M's, with M primes, but all of those prime sets, sets of M prime, they're smaller than the original set in the dominant order, okay? So, so this is a non-trivial thing that I can actually parameterize. A priori, you have this matrix Q which reshuffles all of your original basis elements. They will, they will all degenerate. They can be potentially reshuffled in any way you want. So once you diagonalize Q, a priori, you don't have any reason to believe that parameterizing them with M would be a, a good idea. You might, not, you might not expect any smooth dependence or any mean, meaningful dependence. So the um, important understanding we got, I, I, I do not know uh, how to motivate it a priori, that's the whole thing. But an important observation we got is that actually M provides a very nice basis. So, Perhaps two slides later on, I will explain that now. Uh, so I'm explaining things chronologically, how we understood them. But now uh, we understand that this M basis actually comes from the gravity side and it describes the boundary gravitons. So in the retrospect, if I understand bulk physics, maybe the fact that eigenvectors are parameterized by this M is not totally surprising. But anyway, now the spectrum of lambda is very simple. That's the piece which is just L0 dependent. Since it's only L0 dependent, it depends on, uh, it depends on delta plus n. And then I have two terms from the previous slide. I have C over 6, this guy plus 4 delta n. This is here for delta n and C over 6, this guy. And then I have 1 over C squared corrections. Okay, so, so if I look at this formula, I realize that both of these expressions, they only include single sum over index i. That's another small miracle, that they only include single sum over index i, which means the following. If I rewrite this set of mi, the numbers mi, they parameterize Young diagram. And uh, you know, if you have states like that, then you say that M1 is larger or equal than M2, which is larger or equal than so on and so forth. And MR is usually taken to be the smallest number. That creates the Young diagram. So it's inconvenient. If you try to go to the next order, it's actually not correct to try to formulate in terms of Young diagrams. You need to go to what is called Boson representation. Boson representation, uh, or free Boson representation, it counts uh, the number of in integers in this set. So let's say I have a set M1, M2, and so on, MR. I will introduce the following numbers. Number N1 will be the number of times number one appears in this set. N2 will be a number of times number two appears in the set, and so on and so forth. So if you introduce these numbers NK, then you can write this and this in this form. Okay, so mi cube, oh, oh, I'm making a mistake, I'm sorry. Uh, mi cube, you can rewrite this like this. So mi cube will be just cube, uh, k cube, and uh, delta n, that will be this guy. And the coefficients here don't exactly match our coefficients here. That's because they have expanded this q3 to you. Q, Q3. Since I expanded this Q3, this 4 became this 6, and uh, this C over 6 remains C over 6, but also got some constants. Okay, so this was sort of a trivial thing. I just have written the linear term. That's not interesting. What is much more interesting is that in addition to the uh, first 1 over C correction, we are able to calculate second 1 over c squared correction that is highlighted on the, on the slide right now. It's much more involved, but it is at most uh, quadratic in n. So what this guy describes, since it's linear, n k is the number of bosons of a particular kind, and you can think about this um, eigenvalue as 
energy. Your Q can be thought of as addition to energy. So when you, when you can think about these two terms as simply describing non-interacting bosons. You have certain mass, you have bosons of certain mass, and energy is literally, literally proportional to the number of bosons in the system. That's a picture of non-interacting bosons. If you go to high order in 1 over C, your boson masses, while still non-interacting, get corrections. This is non-interacting. But then at the same order 1 over C, you already have interaction of those bosons. So at 1 over C squared, you have two bosons interacting. I expect that at higher order level, you will have three bosons interacting, four bosons interacting, and so on and so forth. Now, it is, I want to say that this is still a very interesting and a priori surprising result that having that young diagram written in terms of the three bosons give you a meaningful one over C expansion. This is a completely new thing. This was not known before. Uh, I do think that we understand the physical origin of it. It is related to the uh, interaction of uh, gravitons uh, in the bulk, and that's something I probably will t tell you right about right now. So, uh, if you have an explicit form of this Q3 and Q5, you can play the game we have played. You can explicitly find this uh, lower triangular matrices. You can find the spectrum, and you can read off the spectrum. That's all good. But there are only two non-trivial Qs known, Q3 and Q5. So once we found the, that, that spectrum, we cannot go any further. But then the real thing is that if you conjecture that for all Qs, Q7, Q9, and so on, leading 1 over C uh, behavior is described by free non-interacting bosons, that gives you huge constraint. If you know that your spectrum describes non-interacting bosons, then to read off the spectrum, you really need a little bit. You only need maybe something like the following. You calculate expectation value of this Q in the conventional, excuse me, in the conventional Gibbs ensemble with the conventional thermal ensemble. You don't interact over the, you don't calculate over the whole uh, CFT, you calculate over a particular Verma representation, a Verma model representation. If you have an object like that, and you conjecture that Q is describing three bosons in the leading C limit, that already is enough to calculate what I call boson masses. So uh, in October, uh, Alex Maloney with collaborators have calculated these quantities for the first six non-trivial Qs. And we were able in December just to go ahead with the uh, generalizing this formula. We saw that here you have a polynomial in mu, here you have a polynomial in n, you know, you have a polynomial of particular degree, you have a polynomial in delta. We conjecture that <coughs> the spectrum of Q will be linear in bosons, so we are still describing non interacting bosons. It will be a polynomial in K, it will be a polynomial in delta and C. And the only, well, Scaling of delta scales with C, so C goes to the power P, delta goes to the power R minus 1 minus P. So this whole thing is proportional to C to the power R minus 1. This goes like C to the R. It's a typo. It should be, I'm sorry, it should be R. I will not fix it now, but this should be R. This goes like C to the R. That's the leading term. All of these terms contributing as C to the power R minus 1 and then corrections go as c to the power r minus 2. So, so basically, basically yeah. the statement is that uh, despite the fact that you don't know higher q's explicitly in terms of l's, yeah. by analyzing the low ones, you conjecture the, the form of the higher ones. Is it correct? Or uh, yes, this is, this is basically the point, but I can tell you more. I can tell you how exactly we conjecture the form. We sim simply said that at leading order in 1 over c, those cues describe non-interacting bosons. So the only thing they can do, they can change their mass. They give different contributions to the mass of those bosons. And then, despite the fact that expression of four cues in terms of Virasora generators are not known, to calculate something like this, you don't need uh, Virasora generators. You write cues in terms of the fields. So Q, let's say, is T cube, okay? And then you calculate one point function of T cube. So that's how Alex and collaborators have calculated those six, six functions they got. 
with the six functions as a function of delta and central charge. And then we compared their result with our ansatz, and we were able to fit those coefficients xi, and then we were immediately were able to generalize this xi for all number r of the virasor, oh, excuse me, of the KDV charge. So they only had results for the first six, but we were immediately able to guess it for all Qs. And very recently, this is an unpublished work, we were able to completely reproduce this formula, which this highlighted formula, actually both of them, this one in the context of this one, from ADS. And do, so, do, these, do these three bosons require uh, natural interpretation in these Yes, yes, absolutely. So <clears throat> uh, let me spend some time uh, explaining this. Uh, so those cues from the point of the CFT, they are higher powers of T minu, which means that there's our um, double trace and triple trace operators, which means that if you try to describe them on the bulk side, you need to change boundary conditions. And uh, there was a work a couple of years ago where people actually did that. They found boundary conditions at the boundary of ADS3, which corresponds to high two charges. Uh, gravity in three dimensions uh, has no local degrees of freedom. So all, everything is sitting at the boundary and they actually found the new boundary conditions. And uh, those boundary conditions, the equations of motion at the boundary, they look literally, uh, they coincide with the classical KDV equations. Because C in the, in the bulk, C is very large. So basically, you simply have classical KDV equations. So to get the spectrum, to get this spectrum with these coefficients from the classical KDV equations, what you need to do is you need to do a uh, first quantization. So you essentially interpret those equations uh, as a Schrodinger equation. You calculate the spectrum. Okay. And uh, once we did that, we were able to reproduce all KDV, higher KDV equations are known. Uh, you can uh, calculate them iteratively uh, using gilfan dicke polynomials, which just give you the form of the equation. And we were able to solve the corresponding Schrodinger equations uh, in linear approximation. And they give you a spectrum of non-interacting bosons of this form with exactly these coefficients. So, so we sort of reproduce this formula. I mean, we, we reproduced this formula from bulk side. Uh, we, we were not trying to prove it rigorously on the CFT side. And uh, to prove it rigorously on the CFT side, I suppose someone has to calculate those two charges in the, virus, in the Verasoro form, in the blue, form of the Verasoro generators. Okay, so, so once we have the spectrum of those non-interacting bosons at the leading order, we can actually go ahead and very simply calculate the partition function. Now, it really becomes a uh, very straightforward exercise. If you have some free bosons with mass mk, and you need to calculate the partition function, which is just the sum over all occupation numbers, then this is non-interacting bosons. You simply calculate partition function for each individual boson, you have the conventional Bose-Einstein answer, and then perhaps you just, instead of having a product of non-interacting things, you want to have a sum at the, ter the, in terms of free energy, you have sum of free energies for each boson, okay? Now, this is a general formula. Uh, the mass of the boson Mk, which includes or when you add all higher charges to the Hamiltonian, it is, of course, quite involved. It, call, it is proportional to the chemical potentials. My chemical potentials are now called T. These are my T variables, which I introduced before. And of course, it depends on the subtle point of this delta guy. And then there is a lot of stuff, and there is a hypergeometric function because uh, I have those combinatorial coefficients, well, not combinatorial, but I have those gamma function coefficients, and when you start summing things with the gamma functions, you usually end up with a hypergeometric function. So the mass of those boson number k is given by this formula, which is quite bulky, but this is a very explicit formula. And then we take this and plug it into this general expression for the partition function of non-interacting bosons, and we essentially get the result. So here, this slide, excuse me, here at this slide, we're 
in the position to just write down the expression for the partition function uh, uh, at the uh, first two orders in one over C. I just want to split this calculation into two. There is three bosons and three bosons need to know the value of delta or the value of sigma. And then I also integrate over sigma. In principle, instead of integrating over sigma, remember sigma is rescaled uh, dimension of the primary delta. Instead of integrating over sigma, in principle, I need to sum over sigma, excuse me. In principle, I need to sum over all primaries. So if I know the density of primaries in my theory, I don't have to calculate things in the thermodynamic limit. I can calculate partition function on the torus, and then I will just have a sum over primaries. But sum over primaries is something we usually do not know. It, it is theory dependent, and uh, we do not know any universal result about density of primaries except for the Cardi formula. And Cardi formula only works when dimension becomes infinite, and for the dimension to become infinite, that's the same as to say, say that I'm taking thermodynamic limit. So to have a contained universal answer, I'm saying, okay, I will be calculating things in the thermodynamic limit. That's when my spatial circle goes to infinity. Uh, from the point of view of the CFT torus, it means that my torus degenerates into the cylinder. And I will be calculating the extensive part of the free energy. So that's the part of the free energy, which is proportional to L. In that limit, uh, I don't have to sum over individual primaries. I can integrate over all of them. And I use Cardi formula for the dimension of the, for the uh, density of the primaries. And then I have this quasi-classical integral to do. And then I have this correction coming from one over C from the free bosons. And that gives me F0 and F1, okay? So that's a very straightforward thing. To calculate this, we already essentially calculated this integral. Once we calculate this integral and we understand the settle point value of sigma, we plug it here. And that's the answer, okay? The answer is F0. That's exactly the same formula which I was giving you a couple of slides before. And F1 is the contribution of the free bosons. It has this logarithm, and now it has the integral over K. I used to have a sum over K. K is an index which uh, uh, marks different species of bosons. Now, instead of the... Um, uh, some I have an integral, have continuous thin because, because of the thermodynamic limit. And I need to integrate this logarithm and exponent, and the exponent I have function gamma, and gamma is this rather complicated function. And sigma oh, everywhere here is specified by the, by the saddle point equation, which is this algebraic equation. So basically, this slide summarizes the extensive form of the free energy of the generalized Gibbs ensemble uh, in a, well, in a, relatively explicit form, in a self-contained explicit form. And all corrections are one over C suppressed. Okay, so basically this is, this is what we have now. I uh, think that with some more work, we will be able to calculate F2. Uh, but for, from the physics point of view, I think the most interesting thing is F1, because it encodes first quantum corrections on the gravity side. And I think much more interesting than just trying to calculate F2 is to try to understand what is the physics of those quantum effects on the, on the gravity side. Okay, uh, if you have no questions, I will come to the second part of my talk. I have probably only 10 minutes left, but uh, the second part of my talk, which is much smaller, it's about, uh, it's about uh, generalized eigenstate thermalization. Uh, one question. Yes. Uh, so the boundary conditions that you need to impose in an ADS3 to get the, KD, the classical KDV algebra, is it possible to interpret some, maybe this is a stupid question, but is it possible to interpret it as changing the cutoff slice that you're imposing at infinity? Um, no, I, 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 I wouldn't think so. Okay. So, so I have another question, unrelated question. Um, uh, let, is, let, there, is, is, there, is there some other large C limit that you can take that uh, is also interesting? I mean, basically my question is like, uh, to what extent the, the, the large C expansion that you cooked up is unique? Are there other options to, to consider in the large C limit? Uh, uh, is it okay? I will try to add more to the first question. Um, 
I have an impression that uh, this new boundary conditions cannot be reduced to the change of the cutoff because uh, what you're really trying to do, you try to change the Hamiltonian and uh, it is actually known, the, the, the paper which discusses these boundary conditions, they explain that that changes the asymptotic uh, uh, algebra of asymptotic symmetries. And I have an impression that if you just change the cutoff, that would not change the algebra of asymptotic symmetries. Uh, so I, I have to say that um, this is my current understanding. I, uh, the, this is not, a, I don't have a complete understanding uh, of how things work. Uh, we were able to reproduce this one over C corrections to the spectrum from the bulk side, which is a good indication that we are on the right track, but uh, we are working on the second one over C squared corrections. If I manage to reproduce that correctly, I would say that I understand things quite well in the bulk, but uh, we're not there yet. So I hesitate to say that I understand bulk situation completely. Okay, uh, so that was about the first question. Uh, the question, if there is any interest in one or a C limit besides the one we are considering, uh, uh, could you please, um, could you please, uh, add to your question, what, do you have any example of uh, what you have in mind? Well, I, my, my question is basically, is, are, are the, so, so beta is some one number, but like uh, do chemical potentials that you introduce are, are they, are, there, are they order one or like do they scale with uh, C? Right, good, good, good. So, so, so very good question. So the one over C expansion we introduce is that you can keep chemical potentials T let me actually show you what T is. Uh, for that, we actually need to go to the very beginning of the talk. Uh, we keep fixed T, right? In the, this formula, this formula assumes that this is one over C and F depends on T, which means that be, T better be of order one. So T better be of order one, which means that mu is one over C to certain power. If you instead take C, mu to be of order one, T will scale with C, and then this expansion doesn't make any sense. Uh, what we understand is that this is a good expansion. It was not obvious that this is a good expansion. The naive expansion was to start with mu and start expanding in mu, and that didn't work very well. We saw that you need to calculate things non-perturbatively in C, you need to calculate things in a way we couldn't calculate. So this is a good expansion. I feel this is the right expansion from the physical point of view, including the bulk side. Uh, but in principle, if you have a full non-perturbative answer, then of course you can say, I want to keep mu constant and I want to take C into infinity after keeping mu constant. But that means that uh, in my language, keys will go to infinity, which means that all of these guys will contribute together. Uh, it would be, of course, interesting to understand this regime as well. But from my point of view, this is a completely non-perturbative regime. And I believe from the point of view of gravity, this is a completely quantum gravity regime where the central charge cannot be taken to be large in, in some sense, because those mu's, they will scale with a central charge. Okay, that's right, right. But, but uh, uh, going back, what it means that you take mu to scale with a, well, I, I think effectively your mu will scale with a central charge if you, well, if you take effective chemical potential on the gravity side will scale with a central charge. So it means that you perhaps have classical or quasi-classical gravity, but the boundary condition goes to infinity. So you have something singular anyway. I didn't think much about this, but that may be something worth thinking about. Okay, uh, so let me say a few words about generalized angus internalization. So I guess I have like a couple of minutes left, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so the idea is that we were trying for like last two, three years, we were trying to see if I can say thermalization can be formulated in the context of the CFT. I'll go perhaps a little bit faster, but the idea is that you can formulate eigenstate thermalization for a CFT just starting from the conventional uh, 
uh, idea that you have uh, eigenstate, energy eigenstate, and expectation should be a smooth function of energy. And then in the CFT case, this function can be actually fixed by dimensional analysis. But once you calculate uh, ETH for CFT, you can try to see that it actually doesn't work very well. First of all, uh, usually ETH applies to all or to most eigenstates. In the, in the CFT case, if ETH applies to primary state, it really cannot apply to descendants as well because descendants are dependent on primaries. So once you, formal, once you postulate the expectation value for a primary, you can calculate the expectation value for the descendant and it will not have the same form. So that's already one problem that you cannot say ETH applies to all states. You have to say ETH applies only to some states. Perhaps it applies to primaries. If you say that it applies to primaries, next question is to ask whether this expectation value is actually a thermal value. You start comparing your results with the thermal ensemble. At the infinite C limit, you see the, uh, you see the agreement. Once you start adding one over C corrections, you see that no, in a CFT, expectation value is not equal to Gibbs ensemble value. This expectation value is not truly thermal. Then you ask what's going on. ETH is broken. So one idea we had last year in 2018, uh, and uh, that was the paper you, you mentioned when you contacted me first, the uh, paper about uh, universality of quantum information. We said, look, we should seriously think of comparing the expectation value in a CFT, in two-dimensional CFT, not with a thermal uh, ensemble, but with a generalized Gibbs ensemble, because we have additional symmetries. But once you try to do that, you actually will see that this is also not working, at least for primaries. Because for primaries, and this is an exact, this is not one over C expansion, this is an exact result. For primaries, expectation values of higher Qs are simply the powers of Q1, simply the powers of energy density. And we see something like that for the GGE, right? We saw literally this equation working for the GG, but in one very special limit, C goes to infinity. If you try to calculate uh, the relation between higher QDV charges, uh, density of uh, higher QDV charges, and density of energy, uh, energy density in the GG ensemble, you will see that as soon as you add one over C corrections, and of course for that, we needed to calculate the partition function. So this is something I can only tell you very recently, but once we calculated the partition function, we saw that once you calculate one over C correction, the relation between Q higher Qs and Q1 is not simply the power, which means that GG also fails to describe uh, primary states. Okay, so then you are you should be worried because it means that uh, ETH really doesn't work because uh, expectation value in the eigenstate in the primary eigenstate does not really match. So this is not now a question mark. It's not working. It's a sign that they're not equal. The uh, primaries are not described by the generalized Gibbs ensemble. What is going on? So I think the resolution comes in the form of the generalized eigenstate thermalization. And the resolution is the following. The con conventional eigenstate thermalization is a statement that energy is the only relevant thermodynamic quantity. And then expectation value is just a function of energy. And the generalized eigenstate thermalization is a statement that expectation value is a function of all conserved charges, okay? There are still much less conserved charges than the states. So if you specify the value of conserved charges within certain narrow corridor, you still have exponentially many states within that corridor. So this is a very non-trivial, very interesting statement to make. But now if we make the statement, we can actually try to check it and we have a conjecture. It's based on preliminary calculations. I don't want to go very deep into details because this is work in progress and this is a conjecture that the expectation value of local operators are in the eigenstate, in the eigenstate is indeed specified, but this is not a primary eigenstate. I will specify it in a second. Uh, expectation value in an eigenstate is indeed a function of conserved charges Q. So we even found some explicit formula in one case and we relied on some non-trivial cancellations, but it's a conjecture, so I need to be careful about this. But if things work like they work, and this is, uh, so then we have a picture of generalized eigenstate thermalization, 
then this picture will automatically say that the uh, eigenstate can be described in terms of the generalized Gibbs ensemble, okay? Which seems to contradict what I just said a minute ago. So let me spend the last minute of my talk to explain what's going on. What is going on here is the following. We were looking previously, we were mostly looking at the primaries because this seemed to be the simplest states. But from the point of view of the Q charges, primaries are very special states. Primaries are sitting at the edge of the phase space. Okay? If you have higher charges Q, then it's an algebraic thing that higher charge Q is larger or equal than, the, than Q1 to the power K. Okay? So this correction is always non-negative. But it so happens that specifically for eigenstate, excuse me, specifically for primaries, this correction is literally zero. So, so primary states are at the edge of the phase space. So if I conjecture, if I postulate the expectation value of some operator is just an algebraic function of Q, it absolutely guarantees that I can describe that through the generalized Gibbs ensemble. Right? It's absolutely provided that there is a generalized Gibbs ensemble which can have expectation values of Qs which I, which I demand, okay? So, so in other words, uh, I have an equivalence of ensembles, but I need to be sure that there are chemical potentials mu which can, uh, there are chemical potentials mu such that my generalized Gibbs ensemble have given set of expectation values of Qs. In other words, I need to solve inverse Legendre transform, okay? Or maybe I was too fast and I'm a, a bit nervous going over time, but let me just say it one more time. If you, if you postulate that generalized eigenstate thermalization works, then equivalence of ensembles will come automatically. The only non-trivial thing, the only subtlety is that you should be able to find mu's such that you reproduce your given set of cues. And for most set of cues, this is not difficult to do, but for the particular set of cues, which corresponds to the uh, primary, excuse me, to the primary states, that's difficult to do because you want to live at the boundary of the phase space. And for that, chemical potentials of the generalized Gibbs ensemble have to be singular. So, Using the explicit form of the generalized Gibbs ensemble of the partition function, you can calculate this quantity and you can see that if you want to equate it to zero, this whole thing has to be zero, which means that this gamma has to be singular. This gamma has to diverge and for that you need to take T to be infinity, for example. So basically, I, primary states are very special states. To describe them, you need singular generalized Gibbs ensemble. But as soon as you go from primary state to slightly, slightly different states, something like primaries with, the, excuse me, with some, some highly excited descendants. Um, I don't have time to explain that in detail, but basically what you try to do, you try to take a primary and act by descendants, but the energy associated with the delta, with the primary, is still much larger than the energy associated with the descendant level then it's not a big deal to find finite chemical potentials mu such that this difference between high IQs and energy density will be captured by the general Gibbs ensemble. So then, then GG will perfectly work. I have, I have a question. So is the, is the problem of finding the chemical potentials uh, uniquely posed in the sense that the answer is going to be unique or? No, no, that's not, it's the question of simplifying an even one set of chemical potentials. Oh, so, so you don't know if there are more solutions? Like you well, know. basically I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say several things. I'm trying to say several things. One thing I'm trying to say, if you manage to find the set of chemical potentials, then GG will describe a particular state you are looking for. Uh, you you want to describe. That's a statement number one. Really? Statement, statement number two: primary state is special, and I know I can prove that there is no set mu which is not singular, which will allow you to describe a primary state. That's the difficulty we observed before. Okay. We did not understand it, but that's a difficulty we observed before. Since 
prime, primer is sitting at the edge of the phase space, there is no non-singular combination of chemical potentials such that you can describe those states. But there is a singular set which will describe those states. Third thing, I do not know when mu's exist and when they don't exist, and I do not know when they are unique and when they are not unique. I do not know. That's a problem which is difficult to solve. But one additional thing we understood is that if you want, for example, Q3 to be somewhat different from Q1 squared, namely, if you want to violate this inequality, excuse me, if you want to say that Q3 is larger than this, then some of the chemical potentials must be negative. That we can prove analytically. That's not a problem. You can have negative chemical potentials. Your partition function is still, uh, it's still completely convergent and everything is fine. But it's a curious thing that you might have negative chemical potentials and you perhaps might even have negative uh, chemical potential mu1, which means that this is like conventional temperature. And it would be interesting to understand how those ne uh, negative chemical potentials work on the gravity side. Uh, but Anatoly, one question. Uh, you, there's still a constraint that the highest charge that you're choosing, the chemical potential associated yeah, yeah. with that one has to be positive, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah, of course, of course. Okay. I assume that. I assume that uh, partition function is well defined. I'm only working with partition functions which are well defined. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you will have some set. The highest guy will be positive. It will assure convergence, but lower guys must be negative because without them being negative, I can prove that you cannot uh, get Q3, which is larger than certain value. Yeah. And then I can prove that you can get Q3 much larger if you, for example, take mu3 equal, being positive and mu1 being negative or something like that. Well, actually, uh, to get very large Q3, you need to have mu1 being positive, mu5 being positive, but mu3 being negative. With just three charges, you can have arbitrarily large Q3. Okay, so, so uh, just to conclude, I think it would be very interesting question to understand what those negative chemical potential mean, chem chemical potentials mean on the gravity side. I want to say that this is not going to indicate a disaster, even if you have mu1 being negative, because at the leading C order, we know how things behave on the gravity side. At the leading C order, classical gravity, you have a unique solution, which is a BTZ black hole, and it's, it is completely controlled by Q1. It is completely insensitive. Q1 is the energy density, and you have left and right energy densities and that completely specifies BTZ black hole solution. So even if you have in the dual GG ensemble, you have some of the chemical potentials being negative, it doesn't matter, energy density is positive, so your BTZ black hole will be the conventional one. But somehow at one over C order, the fact that your Qs are not exactly related to each other by Q, Q3 is not Q1 squared and so on, somehow will be known, black hole will reflect that, but we do not fully understand how exactly. So that's, I think, a very interesting, very important question to understand. I, I, uh, just to save time, I understand that many points here could be discussed in detail and I could have explained them better, but I, I just don't want to hold you. So let me quickly try to go through the conclusions. The, the main results uh, is that we understand the spectrum of QDV charges at leading one over C order that allowed us to calculate exactly the uh, free energy of the generalized partition function in the thermodynamic limit and large C and it is completely non-perturbative in chemical potentials and we already have one over C correction which captures quantum corrections on the gravity side that allows us to discuss some non-trivial physics and second uh, important understanding which is perhaps not fully complete, but we are hopeful that this is the right picture, is that two-dimensional CFTs actually satisfy generalized eigenstate thermalization, and they satisfied it in the conventional form. And the problems which we, we saw before and which were difficult to understand were related to the fact that primary states, which we are, we are keen on working with, are actually quite special. They're sitting on the edge of the phase space. 
And as soon as instead of considering uh, instead of considering primary states, we will start considering descendants, things will simply become much nicer and smoother, and we will be able to move, match things to the generalized Gibson sample. While the primary states also correspond to the generalized Gibson sample, but perhaps to a singular one. So these are the main results. And the outlook here, very, very quickly, the outlook is, of course, I'm very hopeful that we will be able to uh, continue the progress and descending spectrum of QDV charges. Uh, I didn't have time to speak about that, but there is a particular idea which perhaps we will be able to continue with one over C expansion and maybe find an analytic form. Because in the end of the story, we are describing interaction of boundary gravitons. So I'm thinking that maybe if we are lucky, we will be able to write full series of these expansion terms quadratic, uh, like two, two gravitons interacting, three gravitons interacting, and so on and so forth. That will be an infinite series, but all terms in the series will be known explicitly. And uh, of course, uh, what we did in this paper, we only checked, or wait, excuse me, not in this paper, in this talk. What I discussed in this talk, this conjecture about generalized eigenstate thermalization, all the studies we did was at leading order in C, it would be important to go beyond leading order in C to see if things are modified. And uh, the most important question for me right now is to better understand physics of the black holes, uh, which are labeled those two charges. Well, I, I think, I think that, that, that is all. Okay. Thanks very much, Mike. Thank you. Thank are there you. any further questions? People from online. Okay, uh, if there aren't any more questions, then let's thank Anatoly again. Thank you. Thank you.